I know most people put water in this. This is just all coffee. This is all coffee. Hello, welcome to another video with me. My name is Melissa and on today's video, we are going to be talking about your signature style. Now I have talked about this in other videos of how to find your signature style, but a lot of those videos mainly focused on the clothing and garments, which makes sense. However, there are other things that do contribute to your signature self, such as your signature scent. Maybe it's your bag, your shoes, jewelry that you wear daily. It could be many things because your signature style isn't just one component. It is a collection of all these things that make you you. Okay, so let's talk about my personal journey of finding my signature scent. So like I mentioned, there are people like Adele who has found her signature perfume in her mid-teens. Almost 29, I didn't have a signature scent, but I think we got there. When it comes to finding a signature scent, instead of finding a muse that you want to emulate, like I normally talk about, recommend diving deep into more of your memory bank and thinking of notes that feel nostalgic to you. So for example, I have always been attracted to apple scents. It has always been nostalgic to me. I, I'm a fall girl, but also apple reminds me of fall and spring. It just has that overall fresh scent. When it came to bath and body lotions, I've always liked the scents that had an apple as a top note. It reminds me of apple candles that my mom would light during fall. So I've always been on the hunt for some kind of fresh apple scent. and. It's so hard because some apple scents feel or smell too artificial. So at the beginning of my journey, I found apple juice from Zara and it got a lot of great reviews. And the biggest problem with it though, is that it doesn't last long. And when you get a little closer to the end of the bottle, it has that cheap alcohol scent that you would get from cheap perfumes. This is $10 and you don't have to buy a designer perfume to guarantee it's longevity, but there there is that. I do love the apple juice perfume, but I wanted something a little more mature, something that lasts a little longer, and something that smells a little more unique, you know? And I was scrolling through TikTok, as all of us do, I feel like, and someone was talking about weird perfumeries or unique perfumeries to look into, and she was talking about zoologist. I highly recommend you go on their website. It is a sight to see every illustration of each of the animals that inspire each of the perfume is so unique and so well done. And you can tell that there's so much, so much thought that went into each product. And if you look at each of like the animal scent, there's like a story, um, which with each one. So this one I'm holding is called cow. Um, I won't, I won't bore you and read the whole thing. But it says, zoologist cow brings to mind a, a bucolic scene, a myriad of scents from mother nature's nurturing blossom. Bosom, bosom, oh. Hmm. Innocent floral sway among soft grasses while apple gently sweetens the soft aroma of fresh milk. The cool thing about zoologist is that you can actually purchase samples. Each of the sample was $8 and I got four scents that had apple as its top note. So I got cow a uh, panda hummingbird and i don't know how to pronounce this but i've been calling it the monkey perfume so when it comes to cow uh, i did a recording of my first initial sense when i got it so when it comes to cow the first thing that came to mind was it was extremely fresh like it had a very soapy fresh out of the shower type of smell and as you let it linger on you there's like a milk note in there that's very surprising the girl that I found a review on this said it was like a pleasant lactic scent and that's not attractive sounding. However, what it reminded me more so of is like, like a Japanese creamy candy. Like there's a lot of Asian candies out there that have like a milk or cream in it and that's what it reminded me of. And I think that was an addition to the nostalgic factor that I was looking for when I was looking for apple scents. But when it was wearing on me, it didn't smell just like apples. Like it literally smelled like the apple that was still on the branch of the tree with that unexpected creamy note. Okay, so when it comes to panda, panda has a very grassy smell, like after the rain type of musk. And 
It very much reminded me of the stereotypical men's cologne that you would smell mixed in with these grassy scents. And honestly, I just didn't think it was for me. It was still a very pleasant smell, but I think that grass scent was just, it was too much for me. Hummingbird, I had a lot of promise for. Um, it has a very heavy scent at the beginning, for me at least. It kind of reminds me of gardenia perfumes that one would associate with their grandma. It is a very luxurious type of scent though. I feel like there, this is definitely for a certain scent profile that doesn't really work for me. I, after doing this whole exercise, I definitely learned a lot about myself and that I truly do prefer scents that aren't too heavy and things that are a little more lighthearted and more of a fresh scent profile. I liked it though. It actually had more of a cherry note though than an apple. So it was a bit of tartness and it was kind of powdery and heavy. So I think if you're into like old Hollywood scents or things that smell um, what some people may call grandma, E, I don't think that's such a bad thing. I can't think of another terminology, but that like vintage type of profile. I think Hummingbird is really good. It's very luxurious. And then the Monkey Perfume. I really liked this. I think this is second place for me. This is truly the most fall scent out of all of them. It has that apple, cinnamony, very yellow, orange, red leaves type of feel. It's very like a warm hug and it truly is like fall in the 90s, if that makes sense. Or at least that's what's nostalgic to me. The only thing was why I'm not choosing this as my usual scent profile is because, again, it was too heavy and it was actually something that I would much rather have as like a room spray. And but I do like it. It's very it's very fall um, and it's very yummy. I think out of all the scents that I liked and I kept craving for more and ended up using the entire sample was cow. So how funny is that I can say whenever people are like, oh, you smell good. Thank you, it's cow. Okay, next up, we are going to be talking about signature jewelry. So when it comes to finding your signature jewelry, I think this is one that you can find inspiration from some celebrity muses or even influencers. I would just uh, take that with a grain of salt because I feel like when it comes to jewelry specifically on celebrities, old Hollywood, new Hollywood musicians, most of the time the jewelry they're wearing is more of an ad and it's kind of hard to tell which jewelry piece is personal to them unless it's like their wedding or engagement ring. But the one celebrity that I can think of that actually hits the nail in the coffin for this is Grace Kelly. So Grace Kelly, irregardless of what jewelry piece she's wearing, she has stated on and off camera, she will always prefer pearls. And now looking back at a lot of her photos, she really is always wearing pearls. And I feel like that contributed to the Grace Kelly look. Not necessarily a celebrity, but she's kind of known in the TikTok realm is taxidermist and jewelry metal artist, Ta Alice Quapis. Her TikTok, um, I'll put here, but if you look at all of her videos, Alice Quapis has a plethora of chains and necklaces, and she creates some of the most beautiful memory jewelry and she sells them too if you're interested in that. But what I love too is that she did a jewelry tour and every single charm on her necklace was personal to her. There was a necklace that was a glass locket that has a fossil that she found on the beach of her hometown. It's little trinkets that she has had since she was a kid. That actually really inspired me more than anybody of, I want jewelry that is personal to me. I don't want to just buy jewelry anymore that is just, oh, it's pretty. Like I want it to have some kind of story to it. Okay, so I think I actually reached the point of where I'm very close to my signature collection of jewelry pieces. So the first earring that I want to talk about in the forefront is a, it's not a real diamond, but well, a uh, cubic zirconia, whatever, a gemstone and then I have a horn back to it. And the reason why I have it is actually from college. So when I was in college, um, my dad would give me $60 for my birthday and I would always use that to buy me a piece of jewelry. And for one of those $60, 
I found a Rebecca Minkoff front back earring. And it was the first time I ever seen the ear jacket type of style. And I thought it was just so unique. I thought it looked so badass. It was elegant, but it was still kind of edgy because it was like a spike. And it kind of looked like a gauge without having gauges. And this one had a pearl instead of a gemstone. And I wore that thing every day. I considered it my lucky earrings. And in college, I'd pull on all, a lot of all-nighters, so I felt like I was kind of just out of it for most of those four years. And I was on um, the public bus, and I was about to go to a critique, like a very big important critique. I think it was like finals for junior year. And I noticed my ears was feeling more light than normal, and I touch it, and I realized my earring is gone. And I just broke down crying. I think it was just like an accumulation of the stress from school, but me losing my favorite lucky earrings just like devastated me. And I, that same day I tried to look for them online and they were just like nowhere to be found. I couldn't find them again. And even till this day, I can't find a reseller that was selling them. So I went on Etsy and I decided to make shift those same earrings because I miss them so much. And if I were to pick something that's my signature earring, it should be something I, I feel this emotionally attached to. The first ring I got was done through kind of an art trade with the company and wonderful, talented designer Flourish and Charm. She's very special to me because when I first started my whole social media journey, she was actually one of my first mutuals. And we just, we both had like standing as artists and trying to also like make a business while having a full-time job, etc. And I've always admired her jewelry and have always planned on getting a piece. And one day as I was starting my styling business, if you are unfamiliar, I do pers personal styling services for Kibbe Essences and Astrology Style Reading. And she asked for my services in exchange for jewelry and I haven't even started my services yet and I thought this was the perfect opportunity and in exchange she gave me two pieces um, that equated to the same price point as services and that's what we did. So this ring is special to me not just because it's pretty and I've been eyeballing it for a while but it kind of signifies the start of my business. The second ring is a ring that I got from Irish Festival. And overall, it's just a really great memory with friends. There was dancing, there was great seafood, and overall just a happy memory. And having a ring from that time, it just it really warms my heart. The third ring is actually a poison ring. Um, I showed this in my Ren Fair haul. And Ren Fair is something that my boyfriend and I go to every year. And overall, it is one of the few times and few places that I feel like my best self. And I know that sounds like very exaggerated, but Ren Faire truly, to me at least, is a very magical place to be. Like your Lord of the Rings, Skyrim, high fantasy, fantasies come to life. And it is one of the few places that I really feel safe and feel like people are so nice and people compliment you wherever you go. And it's just overall an indescribable feeling. So this ring reminds me of one of the happiest places. Some people it's Disneyland, for me it's Ren Fair. Okay, and lastly for signature jewelry are my two necklaces. So the first one kind of happened by accident. So this piece, um, I won't go too deep into it, but I always, it feels very personal to me because it feels like a protection charm and I will leave it at that and I never take it off. And then the last necklace is the piece that I got from Flourish and Charm. I got the biggest waypoint necklace and both the ring and the necklace are in the gemstone labradorite. So I mentioned why this exchange with Flourish and Charm for the jewelry signifies like the beginning of my business and how it's super important to me but also just supporting a business I truly believe in. And aesthetically I love that Flourish and Charm takes a lot of inspiration from fantasy based jewelry um, but also the Labradorite is very special to me. So Labradorite, if you look at the history of what Labradorite is, it originates from Labrador, Canada and they believed that like the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis was trapped in Labradorite and that's why it was dark in some lights and shine beautiful colors in others. Okay next up is not really in my wheelhouse but I think it is very important to talk about and can be a huge contributing factor to your signature style and that is signature makeup. Now when it comes to signature makeup again it is super personal because it's based off of 
Well, one, what are you inspired by? Two, your unique facial features. What flatters you the most? And three, what complements your overall style? What continues to tell the story that you are personifying? So when it comes to signature makeup, Dita Von Tees is another great example that I like to look for, look to for inspiration because so many people look at Dita Von Tees and think she spends hours upon hours on her makeup. I highly recommend you look into her interviews because she talks about how she has different levels for her makeup, but in the end, it always still looks like a Dita look. Twiggy is another example of someone who had her own signature makeup that is unique to her, and that's where we get like the eyelashes. Whenever we think of these bright 1960s eyelashes, that is a very Twiggy look. Clara Bow was the face of flappers, and part of that, that signature look to her, is her smoky makeup. Whenever you look up documentaries of Clara Bow, it always has to note about her smoky makeup, her super sharp cupid's bow, thin eyebrows that was prevalent in the 20s. So like I mentioned, makeup is not exactly my forte. I actually have more of a heavy focus on a lip. Ever since uh, college, or even, no, even before that, in high school, I have always been enamored by red lipstick. And that's because most of my muses were of the 1950s and 60s. So the red lipstick that I've been really drawn to lately is the KVD in Midnight Flux. And if I want something that's a little more sheer or if I need to moisturize this lipstick a little bit more, I've been using the Bare Minerals uh, Lip Gloss, um, Lip Gloss Balm in Enlightenment. For those of you who are a fan of Black Honey, it has a very similar effect, but it's a bit more of a berry toned. Okay, next up, is signature hair. So like I mentioned, when it comes to a signature look anything, it doesn't matter how old you are, how early, how late you find your signature hair look. However, I do find it important to experiment while you're still young. So for a long time, I thought my signature hair look was going to be super short. I was very much inspired by Kiko Mizuhara when I was in college. And at the time, that was her signature. A lot of the roles that she played in, um, any modeling gigs she did, she always had the short hair. I think some other great examples of people who have had a signature hairstyle where it really has benefited them in the long run. So Josephine Baker was actually known for her hairstyle to the point that she was able to sell products that was based off of her hairstyle. Lauren Bacall, so she had the typical old Hollywood pin curls, right? But she carried that hairstyle until her 80s, until she just didn't want to curl her hair anymore. Either way though, that's still a very long time to uphold your signature hairstyle. And I find that actually very admirable. Okay, let's talk about glasses. So this was actually requested a long time ago. I tried to find the comment, but it was it was too far back. I hope you're watching. Let's talk about glasses and how it could be part of your signature style. It just made me realize like we don't have enough femme presenting glasses wearers when it comes to it being their signature look. Now I actually used to hate wearing glasses because it was synonymous to me for my dorky middle school self and was constantly teased. I associated glasses with this very unfortunate time in my life and now I actually do like glasses on me. And, but it took time. I would be wearing glasses right now but when it comes to filming there is a bad glare but just so you have an idea this is what I look like in my new favorite glasses. How I found my favorite glasses frame and shape. So I talked the, talked about this briefly on my TikTok, but now I have time to talk about it a little bit more. One of my mutuals, uh, Suma Lee, so she mentioned that when it comes to wearing glasses, one of the key components to finding the perfect frame is knowing your color season. I think it really depends on your color season. When it comes to the different seasons, sometimes wearing colors that are disharmonious with your color palette are more obvious than others. So for example, in my lifetime, I have worn brown frames, uh, pastel frames, clear frames, light frames, etc. And it was never obvious that it was disharmonious with my dark winter palette. Now, whenever I wore frames that were disharmonious with my face shape and face essence, it was much more obvious and quite frankly looked bad. So I think it really depends. So for example, if you are one of the light springs or a light autumn, you may want to look into frames that are either transparent or again within your color season. If you are a dark winter or dark autumn, you can look into black frames, navy frames, dark brown frames. 
Um, I think when it comes to glasses, it really is important to try it on um, when it comes to color. I think when it comes to finding the perfect glasses frame, it depends on the kind of effect that you are trying to give. If you want to give a very dramatic feel, then you're probably going to want to look for glasses frames that are a lot more thicker maybe even find glasses that are disharmonious with your face shape. If you want to find glasses that blend in to your overall persona, then you may want to find glasses that truly are harmonious with your face shape. I really like old Hollywood retro styles. And one of the very few glasses muses that we have is Miss Keiko Lin, who is one of the original bloggers, vloggers, and she was so known for her glasses shape and her cat eye glasses. And she's also a person who has an affinity for retro style. She was so well known for her glasses frame and shape that the company Bon Look actually did a collaboration with her. And she had the glasses Keiko in their shop for many years. And I think it was only in the recent years that they discontinued it. Isn't that something? When you are so well known for something that a company wants you to do a collaboration on that. Like you're so well known for wearing glasses that a glass company wants your preferred shape to be sold as like the Keiko. That is so cool. Okay, let's talk about signature bag. I do have bags that I have on rotation that I have been wearing more often than most. This was, this bag is the collaboration between Backstitch Bruja and Lively Ghosts. And I love this so much because it can also turn into a backpack when you put the strap through the back. My boyfriend and I went to Universal Studios and I wore this thing the entire trip. And it got to the point where people started recognizing me and people were like, oh, that's Coffin Girl. So in some ways that is one way a signature bag could be one of yours. Another bag that I wear often is a bag that my Tita Eileen, my auntie Eileen bought for me. She is like one of the coolest aunties I know. And this is this has been my everyday bag. I think that's the closest I have to a signature bag. Some great examples though, in terms of places to get inspiration from. So think about Jane Birkin. And I'm not talking about the Hermes Birkin bag. I'm talking about her basket. That was actually her signature bag. So sometimes it doesn't always have to be a purse. It could be just any carrying vessel, to be quite honest. Even if it is not a certain bag or brand that you always wear, sometimes it's just having a consistent feeling, shape, or fabrication. Okay, next up, we're gonna be talking about signature shoes. So like when it comes to the signature bag conversation, it doesn't always have to be like a certain kind of shoe or a certain kind of brand. Sometimes it's just an overall feeling. So for example, on TikTok, a lot of my videos that revolved around cork goth shoes that were particularly loafers, ended up becoming synonymous with my brand and I ended up getting many more asked and requests to do more loafer um, videos. Which is funny because the everyday shoe that I actually wear more often, whether it's in office or even if I'm just going on a date or going around the park, are my Mary Janes from Circus NY. They're technically not loafers. I love the patent look and they're not Doc Martens, but they kind of have that Doc Martin look. Another shoe that I have been wearing to death that is just so easy to throw on that I don't mind if this ever becomes my signature look are my Vagabond flats. Now I like these particu particularly though, compared to any other flats, it's because of the square toe. Some examples of celebrities who have had a signature shoe look is Zoe Kravitz. So whenever she is being interviewed, some of her favorite shoes that she constantly talks about are her Sambas, which are the Adidas Sambas. And she always talks about how she loves Sambas because they're the type of shoe that really blend into an outfit. And all of a sudden, like when she's doing an interview with Hot Ones, a lot of the staff on that show would associate Sambas with Zoe Kravitz. Um, another great example is Dita Von Teese and her Louboutins. So there are many celebrities who wear Louboutin, but when it comes to Dita Von Teese, it is truly her signature shoe. She has a large collection of it, and that's because she is best friends with Christian Louboutin. There are so many other things that can be considered part of your signature look. Nowadays, it's your Stanley cup. This is not Stanley. This is the simple modern Halloween edition. I don't mind if this becomes part of my signature look. Literally anything. Be the headphones that you constantly wear on your head. Be your sunglasses like Victoria Beckham. If you watch this whole thing, thank you so much. And until next time, Bye.